Well, today we have on the podcast Mario Dottillo, and I'm so excited to have you here with me. I met Mario a couple of years ago doing what I learned to do in business, which was cold calling, uh, which was funny, but that's actually how we started talking. It is. Um, and Mario is a special business person because he is tackling things that most people are just afraid to do, um, is the truth, right? It's like a big, massive behemoth of uh, mobile home parks and self-storage. And so welcome, first of all. And second of all, um, what made you transition from, I know you were like flipping houses and doing different things in real estate before, what made you transition from that to now, you know, commercial and to mobile home parks and self-storage? Yeah, for sure. First of all, Maritza, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here. And it's cool to see how your careers even evolved since we first met and sat in person and talked about working together on some things. And so um, I'm just excited to be here and be on your show. So thanks again. A um, little bit about kind of my background. I was flipping houses from about 2008 and I did some wholesaling as well, all the way up to about 2013, 14. And really what I was doing is I was building up, you know, a, a, a platform, you could call it to do volume. Most of my flips were uh, bank owned properties, or we bought non-performing loans and other things. And it was more of a volume business. So we were making less money per deal versus, you know, doing a few a year, making big bumps on each of those. And what I realized is that I had a job. You know, I, I basically had a job that if I didn't find the next deal, I was pretty much out of a job. And so what I wanted to do was get into a more passive, passive cash flow um, strategy versus a transactional strategy. And so I started looking at all these different property types and being in the single family world, I was comfortable with apartments. Why? Because I knew the tenant base, I knew the customer and I, and I generally understood residential real estate. So uh, took some education to learn about apartments and started looking and almost a year into it, hadn't found a deal that at the time, hard to believe, didn't make sense. You know, in 2014, pretty much in 2013, 2014, anything I would have bought, I probably would have made a killing on. But at the time, it's being conservative based on what things looked like at that point. So um, somebody brought me a mobile home park and said, I know it's not an apartment, but kind of looks like an apartment from an operations standpoint. And I actually ended up buying the non-performing loan on that park, foreclosed it out, and that was my first park deal. And I just have been focused on that with just a, with just a side portfolio of self storage. I buy, I focus a lot more on the park side than the storage. Got it. And so, what you were looking at multifamily, but then you transitioned into mobile home parks. So, what gave you the confidence to say I can do this, even though you know I have never done this before? Yeah. Well, I had researched apartments enough and I looked at probably over a hundred deals. And so in general, I was very comfortable getting into the larger commercial assets by that point, but really mobile home parks aren't that much different than apartments. And so for me in our due diligence period, I was able to do a ton of research real fast and just kind of figure out the nuances between the apartments and the mobile home parks. Additionally, Right around that same time, it was kind of a weird situation. Uh, my wife and I had went to an event. We met another couple, real nice couple locally. And the guy tells me that he's a regional manager for a very large mobile home park operator. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I'm buying a mobile home park right now. And I told him where, and he's like, that's 10 minutes from the one that I'm based out of in wow. Naples here. And so he ended up actually managing that first park for me, which made my life a lot easier because I didn't have to know every detail. I was able to kind of use his skill set to manage that in the first few properties until the point where I ended up just starting my own management company and um, hiring somebody with a lot of experience in property management to run that. So I did have one thing that I'll tell you. I'm not good at a lot of things. And, and so having really good people around me and on my team is really how I've gotten to where I'm at. You know, I've never done property management personally. I've never collected rent from tenants personally, but I've owned a management company for, you know, seven, eight years now because I've had great people with a lot more experience running that. So really the who, not how, right? Which, 100%. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I would say 
I've gotten better over the years at finding the who. Uh, I can't say I've always been the best at picking the right people, but I think through trial by fire, I've found some really great people and uh, couldn't do it without them because they're they've got tons of experience in what they do. And I'm, I'm pretty much just good at talking to people and and, do, and <laughs> buying deals and raising money. That's about all I'm good for. That's a big, important part of it. So let's <laughs> <It> not, <helps. laughs> let's not diminish the uh, value you provide. But um, so let's go back to the first deal, right? The first mm-hmm. mobile home park deal, because I'm sure there are plenty of people that are in real estate, but you get comfortable in a certain niche and you, you say, you know, this is all I know. And then you're, it's funny, but I know a lot of people in real estate, but they're scared to go into other niches because they don't know it. Right. It's the fear of the unknown, which, you know, I think we all have, but, um, but we're able to step into things that we don't know with like just a little bit more, I don't know, faith. I don't know what it is, but you're just able to do it. And so you found this one person what rooms were you in, right, to be able to talk to this person? What value were you giving this person so that they wanted to be a part of your team? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because that one came from a social function. It was just, it was, it was, um, it was a unique situation, put it that way. I try and network. I get into a lot of master. I'm in a lot of masterminds. I'm in a lot of business groups and things like that where I made where I've made some really great relationships. That first relationship, though, um, the gentleman that I was talking about was actually from a social couples group locally that my wife and I went to. So it was just totally out of left field, which is kind of cool. I mean, people get put in your path that. Um, from all different directions, a lot of times from ways that you don't expect. So I would recommend anybody who's getting into business or currently in business, just be open. Even if you're not in a business setting, look for ways that you can actually add value to people or ways that you can work with people or do things with people, even if it's in a social function, because that's how I stumbled across him. It wasn't um, in front of a room or in any sort of you know, networking group for business at all. Um, but I do, I am involved in quite a few masterminds, three masterminds right now, which is enough. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> a um, lot. yeah. How do you pick which masterminds to be a part of? Cause there's a bunch. So very good question. You know, it's funny because up until I want to say about four years ago, I had no interest in being mastermind in masterminds. To be honest, I was seeing people in masterminds on social media and I'm like, that looks so stupid. You're paying all this money just to hang out with people. Like why, why, you know, I can just go and hang out with people or join free groups or whatever. You know, I, I I basically looked down on, on, on masterminds because I felt like it was a waste of money. And if I want to get in high level groups or in rooms, I just network with people I already knew or whatever. So kind of a dumb way of thinking, but until a buddy of mine, Ray was holding a mastermind in Miami and he said, Hey, dude, you need to come to this. I know you're not into masterminds, but look, it's a thousand dollars and it goes all to charity. So you're not paying me to come to it. You're not even paying to go to this thing. You're basically paying, you're giving it to charity and you're going to meet some really high level people that I know you're going to connect with well. And he started talking about some of the people that were going to be there. I'm like, all right, man, I'll do it. And so after that, I saw, I joined three different masterminds over the next year or so. Um, and th- the way that I would recommend people look at masterminds is figure out where you're at in your business or in your career or in your investments and get niche. Like one group that I'm in, one mastermind I'm in is kind of a general commercial real estate group. It's Legacy, um, Legacy Family, which is Tim Bratz's group and um, one that I've made a lot of great relationships from. But that one is more general commercial real estate, a lot of apartments, but storage and all these other guys in, and girls in that. Um, so if I want to network and commercial real estate, that's where I'm at. Um, I'm also in a smaller mastermind that is local called Vistage. It's actually an international group, but they have local chapters and it's a general business group, very high level. You have to be qualified to be in it. And that is, um, that's really good because I can bring more business issues and ideas to the table and learn from people who have built very large companies, some in manufacturing, some in um, uh, 
construction, just all kinds of different businesses. So it's not real estate focused. And then the last one that I'm in is actually more based on systems and operations and scaling. And that, and that has really helped us implement systems within our company and network with other COOs and people who um, are better with the operations side of things. So you can tell that I'm very focused on getting in rooms with people that um, aren't focused on niche things, put it that way. I wouldn't just join three masterminds that are just entrepreneurs, you know, right. um, it's too vague. So niche down, um, basically is the, is the advice to be able to join, um, wh yeah, and, select and, which mastermind. And don't be afraid to spend some money. I think I spent like 65,000 last year, which is actually not that much compared to some of the, some no, of the other not. people I know, but <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a good investment. Um, yeah. the, the amount of, growth that I've had in relationships I've built from it is well worth it. It weeds out all the people who aren't serious if they got to put up some money to be there. Love it. And so is that what you think really separates like these free networking groups? Like there's RIAs and there's like, you know, thinking locally, like grow and like different things, which may be mm -hmm. beneficial, but it's like masterminds is almost like another caliber. What would you say? Yeah, I would say nothing wrong with ARIA, nothing wrong with meetup groups, nothing wrong with any of those, but just recognize the, it's a low barrier to entry. And so someone who drops several thousand dollars to be there um, or tens of thousands of dollars to be there is probably doing things at a at a level where they can afford it, but also they're, they're there to, and intentional about being there and they're going to put effort and energy into being there and adding value and getting value and networking. It's not going to be this, oh, I'm too cool to be here. I don't know why I'm here. I'm the man. It's like, no, I just dropped 10 grand or I just dropped $5,000 to be in this room. I'm networking with every person. I'm building serious relationships because I'm going to get a return on my investment. And so it's, it's just, it's just a lot more intentional and you are going to, you know, be deal you're going to be networking with people who've built something where they can afford to drop that kind of money to be in the room so what is your intention behind the masterminds depends each each mastermind i go to i have typically a, a goal when i go into the room it's either to build relationships with people that i that i don't know in the group yet you know the first one that I mentioned is a much larger mastermind. So there's typically new people to meet there. There's typically new discussions or new, new opportunities there. The second one that I mentioned, which is a small group, that's more of a tight knit group. We're getting deep into issues within our companies. And, and um, so I'll go there with one or two things that I have going on within my companies that I want input from this group. And then the last one is I'm usually going there to pick the brain of people who are, have better systems than I do, or I've got a few issues within our operations that I need input from, from them from. So I typically go in with either specific people that I want to build relationships with or a reason, or, or I'm going in and saying who in this group can help me with this, or it's, you know, exact questions I need answered. And the one with systems, which I think, um, for visionaries, right. Which, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure you're a visionary, not an integrator. Um, and yeah. So um, have you uh, learned a lot? I don't know if you want to mention like a specific mastermind or maybe yeah, sharper. a company. Yeah. Sharper with Gary Harper's. Gary. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, he's, he's amazing. Um, he what I wanted to ask also has to do with just tactically the business that you're running um, in multifamily and self-storage. Um, what are some of the nuances from other commercial, you know, retail or multifamily um, that you've learned throughout the years? Yeah, I mean, I would think that I think that anybody who's getting into any property type should recognize that there's positives and negatives to both you know, right. to, to every property type. I think sometimes we get kind of religious or we get kind of fanboy about what we're doing. And we say, oh, well, I invest in mobile home parks. So they're the best property type. There's no risk in them. They're the best. Everything else sucks. And the problem with that is it makes you blind to your risk. And so um, I would say for mobile home parks, um, they're very stable because we have tenants that own our homes, own their homes versus renters. Yeah, they pay us lot rent, but they own their homes. So they're very sticky. They don't go, they don't go, um, they don't leave often. There's very low turnover and our turnover costs are very low. If we do get a home back, 
because typically if we evict someone, we get the home back, we renovate it and we sell it and sometimes even make a profit. If anything, we recoup our costs through that eviction and lost rent. So there's a lot of benefits to mobile home parks. We're also the lowest cost provider of housing, especially ownership. And so, you know, we're about half the cost of a one bedroom apartment roughly. And so with the economy getting more questionable and with recession, ling we're in a recession, I shouldn't say lingering, but in a recession with people potentially losing jobs soon, being the lowest cost provider puts you in a really good position to fill up and stay full. Um, and on top of that, we're in re a really unique situation where multiple things are coming together for our benefit in the manufactured housing space. For example, um, we have higher demand for affordable housing, but there's also low, lowering supply or decreasing supply of mobile home parks because you can't develop them, all right? And so people are taking the existing communities, developing them into something else like apartments or storage or a higher and better use. And so you have decreasing supply, increasing demand, which makes them even more valuable. There's really a moat around it. You're not gonna have somebody else put a park up across the street from you. So that makes it very unique. There's not many other property types that you don't ever have to worry about competition. Um, and, and so I think there's definitely some reasons to buy mobile home parks. I would say, on the other end, you are dealing with a you know a lower income tenant, which can be a little bit more management intense. Although when they're owners, and you don't have to maintain the units, that definitely helps. We have a lot less turnover than apartments, and you know so we don't have to have as much staff as well. One last thing on the mobile home parks, our expense ratio is lower. So for every dollar that comes in on the revenue side from rents. We get to keep more of that because our expense ratio is usually in the low 40s, 40% um, range where apartments and most other property types are around 50% or even higher sometimes depending on the property. So, you know, for every dollar you add in revenue, you actually get more in equity or more in value on that property. Storage, a lot of benefits to it. Um, I won't go into tons of detail. I don't consider myself a true expert in storage. I own storage, but um, I don't personally manage it. I've got third-party management company and some operating partners that manage the storage I own. But what I would say is I definitely like it for... Um, for going into recessions as well for different reasons. It's very good to keep up with inflation because you can raise rent monthly. There's a lot of benefits from it. It is more management intense, but it's it's definitely resistant to recessions compared to some other property types. I'm not an expert in a lot of things, but um, what I would say is if you're going to look at getting into any property type, especially commercial real estate of any type, you should really position yourself to benefit wherever the economy is going um, and not be buying things that are going to struggle, you know, in the direction right. the economy is going, if that makes sense. Right. Um, and a lot of the things that you're mentioning has to do with like operating partners and stuff. So you don't need to know all the little details that maybe they do because they're the ones really operating it. Right. Um, so my question is, um, over the years, you said you learned trial by fire, right? Uh, like people um, to add on to your organization. So how do you know now if you really hired the right person and that they have the right seat? Man, that's a good question, Maritza. Um, I would say time. You know, a lot of times you hire somebody, especially the hardest people to hire are salespeople because they sell themselves, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. But I would say, you know, when you hire somebody, and this is something that I've personally, our, our company has personally struggled with, is when you hire somebody, onboarding them correctly and thoroughly. You know, there's been times where we've been being a smaller company and um, being busy. A lot of times it's hard to pull people away to sit down and really train people in or get them onboarded correctly. And that can derail them very fast and can be, you know, um, it, it, it takes away the excitement of getting a new job when you're not trained in properly. And so I would say, you know, I would say within probably 60 days, you know, if you got the right person or not. And what a lot of times entrepreneurs do is we like people. Um, especially if you're on the visionary side and you're, you know, building relationships all the time, you hire somebody because you like them. Right. And then when they're not performing, you give them more time and more time because you're hoping they're going to come around. You like them. You don't want to let them go. And what I found is that 
you know, within 60 days or so, if they're not producing the results or getting close to the results, or at least on the trajectory to hit the results, you probably made a bad hire and it could be your fault and not theirs. Like I said, if you don't onboard them correctly too, but yeah, I would say one thing that someone needs to think about when they're hiring is, um, is, is going to be personality assessments and cognitive assessments. That's something that we've really gotten into over the last couple of years, which takes into more, takes into consideration more personality and their ability to learn quickly, quickly. It's not necessarily intelligence, but it tells you how quickly they can learn and absorb things so that they can act on it. And so we do two assessments before we interview anyone to make sure that number one, their personality fits the role. Like if you're a grinder like Maritza, then you, you, you can probably do almost anything for a period of time, but if it doesn't fit your personality, you're going mm -hmm. to burn out or you're going to start looking for something else. And so putting people in the right seat where their personality is going to be energized by that role is going to help you ensure that you're bringing on good people. And that's something that I just never knew about or even um, used early on. So we had a lot more turnover in the beginning than we even do now. And we still have some turnover. I'm not trying yeah. to pretend like we don't. No, I mean, it, it happens, but mm -hmm. it's like learning really what motivates people. It's like when you're in sales, you have to learn uh, your customer, right? Or your, whatever, whoever that customer is, whether you're in a product-based, service-based, doesn't matter. What's your customer? And an employee is like a customer. Like you need to learn what motivates them. Why are they in this job? You know? And so what, who have you learned? What kind of motivations do your employees, like your A-star players, right? What kind of motivation, what kind of people are they? What are the kind of the things they say so that people that maybe haven't had the trial by fire can maybe decrease their learning capacity faster? Yeah. And so are you asking me that as a question you're saying? Is that are, what, what motivations do they have? Is that what you're saying? Typically, yeah. If there's like a common thread among the A players. Yeah, I would say that A players are going to be really focused on getting results less, you know, that sounds kind of obvious, but I found that A players like to work with A players. And so if you're an A player and you're around other people who are basically just doing the bare minimum, that will discourage that A player and they will eventually start looking for other places to work because they want right. to be pushed. They want to grow. They want to learn. They want to be given unique opportunities or ways to um, ways to grow within the company. And that sounds like kind of an interview statement that you, you know, you say, Hey, what motivates you? They go, I want to grow. Yeah. I want to learn, but really yeah. the, 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 the A players actually do. And they're typically, the funny, have you ever heard the term, if you want to get something done, give it to your busiest person. Yeah, um, they'll figure out a way. <laughs> they will do it. And and so they basically defy the the they defy time, right? And so they'll they'll make things work, they'll figure it out. And I think they're driven by that. You know, for me, if when I'm working with people who are pushing themselves, that motivates me. As soon as I'm around people that are just doing the bare minimum, I start to be like, you know what, this sucks. I need to get around some, some people who are going to get something done. So that and money, I think, I think being real that the most motivated people want to see, want to get rewarded. They either want to get rewarded by being recognized. They want a bigger check or they want to move up in status within the company. And that's okay. I mean, it's a game, really. It's a game. Business is a game. And if, you're not willing to, if you're not excited about playing the game, you're probably not the A player. Right. I agree with that. Uh, so I feel like all of this has to do with people, everything, everything that you're mentioning, right? Everything is people. And so a lot of the people listening, I'm sure are going to want to ask, because I did have people that are like, please ask this question. Sure. So I'm going to go through a couple of these questions so that they're pretty quickly, they're pretty quick, they're quick answers so that they get what they want out of it, which I'm like, you know, maybe I have a deal and I want to send it to Mario um, is yeah. what I'm thinking. So who are you using to find leads is one of the first questions, uh, CRE or list or another one. I don't know. Um, to be honest, I don't even know what CRE is. <laughs> um, really what we this do is what is we they go, said. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and that's, and maybe I'm missing out on something, but, um, really what we do is we go direct to owners. 
So we go, we build a database of the communities that we want in a market that we'd like to buy. And then we skip trace the owners. And then from there, once we've got the owner skip trace, then my acquisition managers get on the phone and they just call them and they start building relationships. There's not any magic to that. There's no secret sauce. There's no secret skip tracing tool. It's a matter of building the database, finding the right contact information, and then calling and following up and adding value wherever you can to where the, when the timing is right, the person that you've been calling for the last six months and following up with and building a relationship remembers you and wants to work with you when the timing is right for them to sell. Like there's no secret about it. Um, no. Sure. There's ways to, there's ways to probably get better results or to maximize the, the results and all of that. And that just comes from doing it over a period of time and building up the skills of your acquisition managers and things like that. But we go direct to the owner and we don't, we don't typically work with brokers or anything like that. We're building, don't get me wrong. I will work with a broker if they bring me something, but that's not our strategy. We haven't gotten any real good results with that. Got it. Do you, um, what lists are you using to pull these mobile home park owners? We don't actually buy lists. We will go, well, I shouldn't say that. So mobile home village, I want to say, or one of the sites you can buy a list of the communities, but it doesn't have contact information. In it. We're just basically trying to get a list of the addresses. And then from there, we go skip trace that list to find out who owns it and all their contact information. And so, um, one thing that I've found about lists is they're junk. You know, most lists aren't worth the money that you pay. And they're usually the lists they're, they're, they're called over or the, um, data is not up to date. The interesting thing about what we're buying is there's not a lot of them. You know, there's 44,000, which sounds like a lot, but when you think about it, there's only 44,000 communities nationally. If we're interested in maybe a third of those based on size, geographic area, condition, whatever, that really brings us down to a pretty small database that we've got to work of around 15 to 20,000 parks. And then from there, we're just constantly turning that over in between three people. You know, you can hit that. I mean, if you think about it, if you've done calls before, you can hit thousand, a thousand plus people in a month. And so every little over a year, we're able to call everybody once and plus follow up. So, um, we'd rather build the list, get accurate information and not pay somebody to give us old outdated info. So what are you doing? Are you cold calling? Like, how are you finding these people's contact information? Since you mentioned, right. Can't yeah. find contacts. Are you just mailing them or only cold calling? We don't, we don't buy a list of pre-skip traced. There's multiple softwares out there. You can look them up and there's some that are going to be better for different property types than others, but um, you can actually purchase skip tracing software. So the, really what's all that's, all that's happening is the list dealers that are selling you lists or list brokers, they call them. All they're doing is they're getting a skip tracing software and paying somebody to sit there and look up the owner on county record, then going to the state and looking up the who owns that entity. And then from there, using the skip tracing software to look up the contact information for that individual. That's all they're doing. They're putting it in a list and se sending it to you for a fee. We just skip all that and we just build the list ourselves. is what I'm saying. Welcome to, um, that's exactly what I've done. And people have told me, uh, how did you find this? And I'm like, like ev everyone could do the exact same thing, but, yeah. um, yeah. So thanks for breaking it down that way. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. another thing I, they wanted me to ask has to do with your buy box and where you're buying and why you're buying in those areas. Yeah, we are buying throughout the United States. Um, and I'm going to talk mostly about mobile home parks, but yeah. really 50 plus occupied lots are where we start to get excited. Um, there's certain markets that we aren't interested in, such as the West coast of the United States. So like California, um, Oregon states like those, just because they're not landlord friendly. We're also not interested in Illinois, New Jersey, New York, some of those really socialist states not interested there. They, they hate landlords. So why yeah. give them business and why jump through the hoops? Right. Um, other than that, we'll look pretty much nationally. Um, we like public utilities, of course, but there's private utility properties that we've bought or we'll still consider to buy. We're converting a couple or converting one right now and, um, to city utilities, but generally speaking, if it's a mobile home park and it's 50 or more occupied lots, we should be talking about it. 
happy to partner with people, happy to buy contracts off of people, whatever. Um, on the storage side, really Florida and Texas is where I'm interested. And it's 20,000 square feet or larger. We've owned 50,000 plus square foot buildings, which is ideal. Um, but we'll go down to 20,000 square feet of net rentable, net rentable square feet um, in those two states. Why Florida and Texas? Well, they're number one, they're very strong for population growth. And with storage, especially going into a rece recession, you don't want to be in a place where people are moving out of those markets. So a lot of the Midwest that has been known to be really good over, you know, for decades is now starting to empty out because they're heading south to the Florida, the 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 Texas, the Carolinas, things like that, Tennessee. Um, so yeah, number one, population growth, strong population growth. Number two, they're good states to do business in. And I would say there's enough demand for housing, which then translates into storage demand as well there. Good to know. Um, are you JVing on these deals or, you know, are you just doing a sign? I know you mentioned partnering, so I'm assuming you will yeah. JV, but what, what's the criteria? Let's just like, I, I know this is like all surface level, but mm -hmm. what is really the criteria? What makes you want to JV with someone aside from just paying them an assignment fee? Yeah. Well, and I can, we can kind of turn this into a learning situation for people too. <laughs> and why um, I would say that I'm interested in partnering with people regardless of their situation. So if somebody's brand new, maybe they're even a residential broker, or a commercial broker, or maybe a wholesaler of single family homes or whatever, and they find a mobile home park. I will JV with them. The difference is I'm going to have the majority of the operational <laughs> um, responsibilities. They're probably going to get a piece of equity for bringing the deal. And then from there, I'm going to take it and run with it because someone without experience and without the processes in place and the team and all of that, it's going to be over their head and it's probably not going to go well. Um, especially if they haven't been educated on the, the manufactured housing space too. So Really, if somebody just comes across a deal and brings it to me, I'll give them a percentage of ownership for just bringing the deal and I'll take it and run with it. Now, if someone's experienced with mobile home parks, has a few already, then I would look at potentially letting them do the property management side, asset management side, project management, whatever. And we can break it up into um, different roles within that within that deal. And I've done that with one other group. For the most part, my partnerships have been people just bringing deals and they've been involved in kind of the sourcing of the deal, negotiating, and some of the due diligence help, especially if they're local. But um, after that, I typically take it over, put all the capital together and do, do the majority of the work. But re it's really going to depend on the person's situation. One thing that I would recommend if you're looking to JV or partner with people on any property type, is to make sure that your partners in that deal have very clear roles if they're active in it, and then make sure that you're not, you both don't have the same skill set. Meaning, if right. Maritza and I are both great operationally and we're both just buying it together, and I see this a lot, they're like, Yeah, we want to buy a mobile home park. So, her and I get together and we go buy a mobile home park, but we're both really good op at operations and we're both involved in the day to day. We're probably going to punch each other in the face at some point because we're both good at the same thing. We're both trying to be involved and call the shots. What you really want is if Maritza is awesome at acquisitions and I'm really good at operations. Now we've got balance. Now she can go find the deal and then I can take it from there and run it. And we're both good at different things. And so I've seen a lot of deal, a lot of partnerships fail, including one I had early on fail because of that exact problem. We were both, we were both good at the same thing. And here's the trick or here's the issue with that. The reason why people partner with people who are good at the same thing is because they're similar. They like each other, right? They're friends. They they get along. They both like talking about deals that they're working on, but they don't realize that partnerships don't work that way. <laughs> you yeah, need no, to be good at different things. Not at all. And that's why one plus one cannot equal one. Correct. Should at least equal, in my opinion, five or 10, but some people say three. So it's like, you need to multiply. And the only way you do that is by dividing and conquering basically. Yes. Um, so about that, so operations and property management, the asset management, how did you learn asset management or did you, you have someone in that role 
And if it's not you and it's someone in that role, how did you find that person? Like, did you get this from a referral? Did you find them on Indeed, on LinkedIn? Or was it just like, I don't know, someone in the mastermind? Where are you finding these people if it's not you? Really good question. So I learned asset management partially through that early on education in apartments. I learned a lot of the concepts around asset management. What people don't realize or know is that asset management is different than property management. A lot of times it's used interchangeably, but it's two very different roles. Asset management is going to be ownership responsibilities. So like tax, property tax, insurance negotiations, contract negotiations, um, business plans, but reviewing budgets, overseeing a property management company, it's really the ownership responsibilities, high level legal issues um, where, where property management is daily operations of the property itself. So that's collecting rent, doing violation notices, doing the bookkeeping, doing all of that. That is property management, overseeing onsite, you know, maintenance and repairs where asset management or really even project management is going to be larger capital improvements at properties and things like that. So number one is recognizing there's a difference. Um, so I did learn some of the asset management concepts, uh, learning about apartments, but then also through action. I mean, in the, in the beginning, I had to do all the asset management. I had to do the budgeting. I had to do the, the business plans. I had to do all the contract negotiation and the insurance um, bidding and all of that. And so it came from experience. And then once we got to the point where that was taking a lot of my time and it was slowing me down from going out and looking at new deals and growing, um, I went and hired somebody. And actually it was interesting. The person that I hired um, lived locally. She had recently retired, written a book and was like kind of on coast mode for about six, nine months. And I just called her up and I said, look, you know, how do I hire for this position? If I, I've posted this position on, on Indeed and all these other places, and the people I'm getting are mostly property managers. How do I go and hire somebody in asset management? And I knew she had experience in asset management at a very high level for a really big uh, manufactured housing group um, before she retired. And so she started giving me some ideas and and shortly after that, she reached out to me and said, hey, you know what? This retirement thing is um maybe not boring. what I saw yeah, all, all, it, all made out to be. So I might be interested in maybe helping you just on a consulting level. And then shortly after that, we ended up bringing you on, bringing her on permanently. And she's really been a, just a major asset to me. But one thing that I would tell you is if, if you can hire somebody on a contract consulting basis first, on a small project, you get to learn how they work and if you can deal with them and if they can follow through and perform. And then there's opportunity to hire them on permanently. And that's something I'm actually doing right now, um, which I don't know if I should probably say that on this because it's going to be played live and they may see this, but you know, I'm, I have somebody doing some contract work for me that has a ton of experience and if they do really well with it, I'm probably going to offer them a full-time position um, to come into our company and, and run a division of our company. So it, it works really well to do it that way. But that's how I found our first, um, actually, that was our second asset manager. Our first asset manager, now that I think about it, was brought on um, locally. So I kind of gave you wrong information there. The first hire that I brought on work for me for about two years. And he had done so he had owned a property management company before. And then once I kind of realized that property managers aren't necessarily good asset managers, that's when I went and went to this other person and went, how do I hire good for this, for this role? So how um, did you meet that other person or where did you meet that other person? I don't remember. It may have been on LinkedIn to be honest, or it okay. might've been at a real, I, 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 that's actually a good question. I need to think about that. I don't remember. I'm, I'm, I... I'm pulling back the layers. That's apart. really good though. <laughs> you know what? I think I Googled asset management and her book was being released soon. Oh. And that might've been, and she happened to live in Cape Coral. So um, now that Very I think about crazy. it, either she came up on a search for her, from her book or LinkedIn, but it might've been from the book promotion. And you know what? Everyone tries to complicate things. And it's like, you know what? I found her through Google. GTS, <laughs> man. Google that stuff, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, I love that. I love that. I love that answer. So I'm so glad you said that. Um, yeah. <laughs> another thing um, is just 
I want to get to the really good stuff. And it's basically a lot of people are afraid to do these massive deals for the obvious reason that they don't have millions of dollars in their bank account, Sure. which we all know um, you have to raise capital, um, you know, to be able yeah. to take them down. Um, so where and how have you found the people that you have found to raise capital from? Who would you say are the best people to raise capital from? And just kind of give us some advice on that end. Yeah. So kind of like what you said, sometimes it's the most simple things. Everybody wants to have this in or this pro or this software or this secret group you can join and get all this part of I'm gonna I'm gonna be really transparent here. I am typically not a fast learner and I don't have fast success. So a lot of times people go, oh yeah, you know, you've built this portfolio, whatever. I'm like, yeah, but I've been buying parks for nine years. I didn't build my portfolio in a year or two. It took me nine right. years to get where I'm at. It's just over time, I started talking about it more, which then got more attention. But, you know, even in single families, it took me a while. I told you it took me over a year to find my first commercial deal where I know some people who got started and bought multiple assets in their first year. And so, Sometimes just longevity and being willing to continue at something for a long time and keep trying to tweak what you're doing to get a better result or to find the right people for that seat is actually how it's worked for me. So give an example on the capital side, for example, you know, in the beginning, I started a fund and I failed um, in single family when I was buying and flipping houses, I thought, man, I'm going to start a fund. I'm going to go raise millions of dollars. It's going to be so easy. I just need a securities attorney. We're going to put this together. And it was a debt fund and all this. And basically it was a blind pool fund where you raise all this money and then go out and invest it before you have deals. And I completely failed. I raised zero dollars. I sat down with all these investors that were referred to me and introduced to me and people that I thought had money in my network and outside of it. And I sat down with my little pitch deck or my my PowerPoint on my computer, and I went through it and I pitched it hard, right? Like I, I'm 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 uh, I'm basically doing what I've seen on TV. Right. And the problem shark with tank. that is what <laughs> Shark Tank. Yeah, I'm Shark Tanking it, <laughs> yeah. right? And the problem with that is I didn't have the credibility. I had the wrong structure altogether, and I looked like I needed money. And I and I even though I had experience. I didn't have um, enough experience to just cold pitch like people like that. And so um, over time, uh, especially once I got into commercial property, I realized that people want to invest with people who don't need money. <laughs> just like banks want to give you the money when you don't need it. It's no exactly. different than that. And so what I did is I started educating people on what I was doing or talking about what I was doing and planting seeds. And over time, as we know, investments are typically a timing related thing. You know, mm -hmm. you, some of the wealthiest people I know are asset rich and cash poor because as soon as they get cash in, they're looking to deploy it again. And what I didn't realize in the beginning is that that's the case. I thought everybody who had a lot of money is were sitting on tons of cash. And so when I got no, I took that as they weren't interested as well. So basically by me starting to just casually plant seeds about what I'm doing, talking about deals, I'm working on things like that. The people who had money started hearing that and started recognizing that I was a potential investment opportunity for them. And so after talking about it a few times when I'd you know see them at an event or um, talk to them because I they were family or friends or whatever, um, they would say, hey, I'm selling this property or I've got some cash from this capital event, whatever. What's your minimum investment or what, how, what does it look like to invest in these deals with you? And so they started asking me which put me in a position of strength and a position of leadership to where they were then wanting my services. I wasn't wanting a favor of giving me money. And so right. now I could say, look, this is what I'm doing for my investors. This is the opportunity. And now it became, if you're the right investor for my deal and, um, then I'd like to have you be a part of it, but I'm not desperate for your money. I'm not asking you for a check. And so it just swapped up the rules. And I'm not trying to make it seem like you go and sit down with people like, I don't need your money. And you know, I get to choose who invests with me. That's that's taken the wrong way too. But it's an underlying message that you're sending is, I'm looking for good investors that I can build relationships with and help build their wealth 
but it's got to be a good fit for both of us. So um, long story short, it was building networks. I started getting some sp uh, speaking opportunities as well, where people come up to me and talk to me afterwards. And I kept a database of every person who ever mentioned that they would maybe want to invest in real estate, potentially deals of mine. I kept their phone number, their email, and how I met them, and I kept them in a spreadsheet. And so every time a deal would come up, I'd put it out to that group. And a lot of times those people would say, no, not interested, or no, I don't have the cash free right now or whatever. And then over time, they started seeing consistency and they would put up capital. In the beginning, it was smaller investments, like 100,000. And then over time, I met some people that were much higher net worth and much scalable, more scalable. And that allowed me to work with a lower, uh, a smaller group of investors that could write bigger checks. So I'd have less people in the deals. And it's not, there wasn't one specific thing that gave me 20 investors to invest with me. You know, it was more of a lot of no's, a lot of like small check investors to then a larger check investor came along and then more small. And it was just kind of, process of elimination over time. And I hate to use the word elimination, but over time you're you want to go, with, you're qualifying. Yeah. You want to go with, with the investors that have the most capital that can do the most right. deals. Cause it's less work for you to manage less investors. Yeah. So who are, who are these types of investors? Like, how do they think? How is this, how are these people different than people that would give you maybe a hundred grand to someone that could give you millions? Right. So what, yeah. what would be the difference? That and you're don't, and don't discredit this, and I'm saying as, as us as sponsors, managers do not discredit the smaller investor. They are some of the most loyal people that will refer friends, refer family and do long-term business with you and are going to be some of the funnest people to do deals with. So I don't want to discourage people from working with smaller investors, but there's definitely a difference in thinking. I've found that the investor that... Um, is typically writing a smaller check often has um, more interest or more focus on your deal where someone who's writing a larger check, a lot of times you're a small fish to them. You're a small part of their portfolio. So they typically will have less, they'll want less involvement. I mean, my, my largest investors, we have a great relationship at this point. So if they've got a problem or they got a question, they just call me and it's good. But a lot of times they're not the easiest ones to get on the phone because they've got a lot of other things going on. And so for me, if I want to get some input from them or I want to tell them about something, it's actually harder to get them on the phone where the smaller investors with the 50 or 100,000, a lot of times they're the ones saying, how's the deal going? And they're checking in because they've got that 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 those funds are a higher percentage of their portfolio. So I would say that's different. Neither is right or wrong. And I like talking to the investors. So it's, it's fun for me if I am communicating with them a lot, but um, I would say too, people who are familiar with real estate in general are often easier to work with than someone who's coming from a high paying W2 job. That's never invested in real estate because they're looking at it as though they're investing in stocks so they're just like they invest in other passive things they're looking at it from a standpoint of um a business and so they're not they don't know the risks as well they don't know the challenges that you as an investor have and so some of the times their questions are a little bit um a little bit heavier because they just don't understand the the, the business of real estate investing. So if you can find a few people, and this is maybe a really good tip for someone who's looking for their first um, investors, maybe look within your real, look for people who are already in real estate investment, maybe later in their career, later in their later in age. And you know that they're going to be retiring or kind of wanting to get out of the acquisition side in the next few years and make them mentors of yours, right? Um, and, and get to know them at least, build a relationship with them because a lot of times they're going to want to sell off their portfolio or a, por a portion of it and then take those funds and start investing it more passively. I see a lot of investors kind of going from active to more passive and they're going to go to that those few people that they know and trust that they've been hanging out with at the RIAs or at other groups and they're going to want to put their cash into those people's deals because they know and trust them. And that's a really good way to go out and start now establishing those relationships for future investments. That's gold. I just want to highlight the fact that, uh, well, you've said like 
just gold. Like you, you, these are the kinds of things that really interest me. Um, these kinds of conversations, because you get so much valuable information from YouTube, from Google, from, you know, like, I mean, it's, <laughs> and it's all free. Whereas before you would have to pay, I don't know how much money, but a lot of money in order to be able to get that kind of information. So if you don't apply what Mario has said, I mean, you're crazy. So <laughs> that's all I wanted to say. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about, and this is basically like the last question or the second to last question, unless you spark another curiosity in my head. But I know that you work with your father, I believe. I don't know if you still do or not, but okay, yeah. you do. So what are some of the lessons that you've learned from your father about business, about real estate, what, whatever it is that you have found have been fundamental in your career? Yeah. So interesting. My dad had, tell you a little story. Um, I had started a real estate brokerage in Minnesota with another partner. And that's how I kind of got into real estate. Growing up, my dad was in construction. He was a custom home builder and um, sold uh, commercial construction material and things like that. And so I had been on job sites as a kid and I was like, I don't ever want to be in real estate because that's what I thought of real estate. I was, I just didn't want to get my hands dirty. And I, so I thought real estate was construction. And later on in life, you know, in my late teens, early twenties, I started a brokerage with a business partner of mine. And then when I started getting into more distressed property and helping investors buy things, I'm like, huh. This is different than what I remember about real estate. And so that's when I partnered with my dad. I said, you handle the construction. I'll handle the acquisition and disposition and you know, help raise money and do all of that. And again, he was good at one thing. I was good at another. My dad was not interested in acquisitions. That wasn't his skill set, right? He was right. good at project management, construction. He knew it very well. And so again, we I partnered with someone, even though he was my dad, he had a very complimentary skill to mine. Um, skill set to mine. And so, you know, to answer your question, some things that I've learned from him, I would say probably patience is one thing that he's very good at. He's very like mellow, low key. I get my energy from my mom. My dad is like super chill, easygoing guy, easy to deal with. He's always got that silver lining view and things are not going well. He's like, yeah, we'll work it out. We'll figure it out. I'm like, yeah, of course. Easy. But for that's you good to, to that's good though in business. I mean, it's, you deal with well, life, right? You deal with yeah. so many complications. So it's good to have someone that's like yeah. mellow. He's stable. definitely a more mellow, kind of like, we'll figure it out, you know. And and I I've always had a positive attitude, but I can't say that I always held my positive attitude when things got super challenging. But like, this sucks. You know, he's like, hey. <laughs> We'll figure it out. I don't have the answer, but I'm sure you'll figure it out was kind of his attitude on some of that. But, you know, um, really, he's super mellow, super like low key. And on top of that, um, always kind of had that silver lining on everything. And was just like, I don't know, we'll figure it out. But, you know, he's at the point now where last month he was actually supposed to retire. Um, and so I found somebody to kind of handle the, actually my brother's coming in as a construction manager now, which is kind of cool. I get to work with him for the first time. He's taking over my dad's, um, daily roles of, of construction management. Nice. And so, um, yeah, but what's neat is that, you know, he's retiring and I'm kind of taking it and continuing to grow and, and go with it. But, if you're going to work with family, just make sure that you complement each other well and that you can actually shut off the, the business conversations. Because when we're around other family, when it was when my brother and my mom and I and my dad were all at dinner at holidays, we didn't talk business. We knew how to shut it off and just be family. But I think a lot of times it's hard for family members to do that. And it can create I mean, a lot of people. It, I get one of two things when I mentioned that I work with my dad. Oh, man, that's that's crazy. You work with family. I could never do that. Or it's like, yeah, I, I wish I could work with my family or I, I love working with my family. And, and I think for me, it's worked out well, but it's not the best for everybody. Right. I think it really depends on the family and personalities. If yeah. you're both like high, high intensity and you can't shut it off, um, it could be a problem for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that from personal experience. <laughs> Yeah, I could say that. Some, some, my, my mom and my dad can't work together. They're like, nope, we tried it once. We'll never work together again. Where 
um, you know, my wife and I do work together on, on, a, on, on my coaching program on my education company. She runs that. So like, we're able to oh, work nice. together where, um, you know, some spouses or some family members just can't do it. Yeah, I agree. I work with my spouse. And so what the funny thing is my husband can be very mellow, like what you were saying. So that's really good for me, but he's, but he he's like a double-edged sword because he's mellow, but he's also high intensity. Yeah. So I'm, pretty intense so it's like okay <laughs> what are we doing here <laughs> you gotta you gotta <laughs> tell each other to chill out every once in a while <laughs> <laughs> exactly um and so before we end I know you have so many resources you're on social media everywhere and you're just you have so many things going on and so what would be what are some of the resources that you would like for people to join I know you have a Facebook group um YouTube and just a myriad of things, your coaching program. So where can people find out about that stuff and where can they find you? I'll give you three places, depending on where somebody's at in their career, what they're trying to accomplish that'll help everybody. So number one, if you just want to know what I've got going on and have connect, have one central place to see everything and every way you can connect with me, it's mariodatillo.net. Super easy, mariodatillo.net. But if you're looking to invest in real estate, do any sort of entrepreneurship, any sort of business, um, I would go to my Instagram account or also my podcast, MarioDatilloShow.com. And that is a podcast focused around commercial real estate and entrepreneurship. And you'll get a ton of value. I've got super high level guests on my show. People who have built you know, literally billion dollar companies and very large organizations and things like that. So pretty cool. Um, if you're looking to invest in mobile home parks, the easiest place to go would be like um, probably my YouTube channel, mariodatillo.tv. And uh, that's very focused around mobile home park investing. And if you want to actually take it to the next level, there is a lot of information on YouTube, but truthfully, when you're buying multi-million dollar investments, you should probably take that next level of education, get some coaching, make sure that you're working with somebody hands-on that's done it before. And you can just go to getrealcashflow.com. Again, that's getrealcashflow.com. And uh, love to work with people who are looking to take it to the next level. But um, there's probably others, but that mariodatillo.net will cover it. I just want to help people Perfect. at whatever level that they're at. And so hopefully one of those can, can be that value for you. Well, you have lived it and I love, you know, I, what I really love is that you, one of the things I love that you said um, is that you haven't had this like quick success, right? Like this fast, because that is what is highly promoted um, through social media, you know, and but we don't realize that there are a lot of people that feel like if I don't become, you know, a multimillionaire or billionaire or whatever in like a year, then I'm horrible. <laughs> like there's like, I'm not doing anything with my life. Right. I feel like yeah. a lot of people feel that way that are actually action takers and are doing things. And so yeah. the fact that you give um, that perspective of look what I've done, it's taken nine years, right? It's like, yeah. it's like, isn't that, there's a saying you underestimate what you could do in 10 years and you overestimate what you could do in one year. Yes. <laughs> same thing. You, you know, it's the same thing. And so, um, thank you for sharing that because I think that gives a real life, like, yeah. I can't think of another word, but testimony perspective of, of it. Yeah. That. I mean, I've, I've actually been investing in real estate for going on 16 years now, commercial real estate, nine years. And yeah, I think part of it is we get in and we go, man, we, we're going to do this. And everybody on social media is like, boom, they're here, but they don't tell you how many years they've done it and how right. many mistakes they've made to get right. there. So then in year one, you haven't bought that first deal. And you're like, man, I suck at this. I'm going to go do something else. And that's that whole, remember I talked about longevity and being able to just keep pushing through it. That's right. really been my secret is just continue at it, even though it feels like you're not getting the progress that other people have. And then I've only been talking about it for maybe three years on social media. So it's like, yeah, it looks like all of a sudden something happened, but it's really, I was doing it for a long time where I didn't want to talk about what I was doing. So right. um, yeah, hopefully your listeners can take that to heart and um, stick around longer and keep working at it to get the results because they will get it if they keep pushing and keep learning and studying up. I love that. We'll end it on that note. 
Thank you so much for coming on. I, it was an honor to have you. I'm so thankful you came on. And I think a lot of people can get a lot of value from what you what you said. And I know I got value from it. So thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it's my pleasure. I had a lot of fun, Maritza. This is an awesome show. Keep it up. Thank you.